Here's a quick self-awareness update. I forgot to frame this entire podcast without mentioning that uh, the entire posse mentality that is behind America's obsession with vigilantism has everything to do with slaveholders and slave owners and slave enslavement societies uh, hunting down uh, enslaved people. Uh, in order to exact revenge and vengeance and so forth based on behaviors that are arbitrary and generally uh, not based on real crimes or real uh, unlawfulness. Uh, It's just an excuse to use a general insult as a way of hunting down and uh, stringing people up. In this case, enslaved people. Native American people, Mormons even, Mexicans, uh, and other peoples who were antithetical to the uh, white Western overthrow of North America by Spaniards and then by the British uh, and then by uh, naturalized white Americans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. As the West was won, and the South was one, etc. It was it was based upon a kind of mob mentality, a kind of civilian uh, posse based justice, violent justice that did not consider people of color, enslaved people, indigenous people, or brown people, uh, including you know. Mexicans, Chinese, and so forth, anybody who could be othered could be accused of a crime, hunted down, uh, jailed, beat, strung up, hung, tortured, or just killed uh, with a gun or a machete or whatnot. So I want to bring attention to the fact that after I posted this, uh, I had a flood of self-awareness and wanted to address that before I went into a more comic book, uh, Western sort of white American narrative of um, heroic vengeance and a heroic vigilantism and not include the fact that I believe the entire DNA of American vigilantism is based on hunting down human possessions uh, or people who don't belong here and and, and, and uh, raising them uh, or m- making them uh, even worse, making them a... Um, uh, como dia, uh, making them uh, an example for others. And I just wanted to get that in right away as a caveat that I, in fact, am not uh, stupid and not thoughtless and not ignoring historical perspective. So I hope that this helps flesh out the entire programming that we as Americans have received and is based on a multi-general, multi-generational, uh, epigenetic, uh, historical basis upon stealing and taking and stealing and taking a land. And any time that didn't work the way we wanted, exacting vengeance and revenge. And by we, I mean uh, the dominant culture, and by the dominant culture, I mean the Western culture, and by the Western culture, I mean white people. I mean, my people come from Ireland and Hungary and didn't get here until um, uh, the 20th century. So um, they're not my people who did this. But I will allow myself not to play that game, and I will say I am a cisgender white man and am part, uh, through my education and training and, and entitlement, uh, I am part of that, uh, that corpus, uh, that identity. Anyway, I hope that uh, helped. I, didn't even, I did this way before I got any negative feedback, so hope that means something. Not an idiot. Uh, and um, thank you. Bye-bye. Well, I am an idiot, but I was able to uh, think this all the way through, and I never do that with any of my podcasts, but
This is important. Mahalo. Before I begin, I want to be clear. The entire theme of this episode is that the uh, ruling that Kyle Rittenhouse is not guilty on all charges will, in fact, embolden both the left and the right in the future because the Rittenhouse uh, verdict is going to set precedence with regards to who, what, when, where, why, and how you can be uh, in a in a public space armed, and whether or not you can defend yourself, even if you're perceived as provoking or being provocative, and whatever that means. Um, and the rest of this, the episode is, is based on that. However, it really focuses on the concept of America always being a pro-vigilante country. And as a result, when the mainstream media talks about vigilantism as being some sort of bizarre thing, America has been programmed to support lawless righteousness going around the law in order to exact vengeance as something sexy and heroic for at least 400 years. Um, Especially when it comes to the Wild West, especially when it comes to modern gun-fu movies like John Wick, uh, Deadpool, etc. So, here we go. Lots of love. Talk to you soon. Season 3, Episode 4, Chris Cast. My name's Chris Abraham. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Chris Cass, Season 3, Episode 4, Anti-Vigilantism, or Anti-Vigilantism. However, I hear it all the time as Anti-Vigilantism, or Pro-Vigilantism, or Vigilantism. But when I looked it up, apparently the word is Vigilantism. Vigilantism. Anyway... We're going to talk about vigilantism in the wake of the Kyle Rittenhouse uh, verdict, which was uh, completely innocent of all of all counts. And um, while I'm not going to go into much moral or ethical uh, response, I am going to talk about what I know about defensive law. I am not a lawyer, and I will also talk about... Uh, what a vigilante is and why America and the world, but mostly America, has been uh, incredibly uh, pro-vigilante since the since before uh, the advent of the comic book. And we'll go into 
the ubiquitous nature of the vigilante as defined uh, well outside um, who you might think would be the vigilante in this narrative, who, which would be, you know, the Joker in the movie um, and the Punisher in his series of, uh, of comic books and movies that are, they're not the only ones. Most of your heroes are vigilantes. Uh, most of them are not law enforcement officials and even law enforcement officials are not allowed to, uh, are not allowed to meet out vigilante justice. We'll come back to this after the break, but that is pretty much my TLDR. Too long, didn't read synopsis. I'm going to try to do them all this way so that you can just stop now and move on to the next podcast. Ciao. Welcome back. This is Chris Cast, Season 3, Episode 4. On vigi- vig- vig- vigilantism, vigil, vigilantism, on vigilantes, on uh, Virgil antes, on vigil. I guess vigil antes are your mother's sisters uh, when they go to mass on Sunday, right? Uh, vigil antes. Anyway, dad joke alert. Should have tri- trigger warning before that. So. Kyle Rittenhouse has been a huge uh, topic of conversation. And he is just, if you will, in many cases, he is just a uh, a symbol. He is just an archetype. He is just a um, red herring, maybe. He is a manifestation of, of what all, what is all, what, what is what all is wrong according to the left and everything that's right according to the right. So, um, as you might well know, Kyle Rittenhouse uh, was armed, 17, and uh, in the periphery of a, uh, of a post-peaceful protest riot. Um, and uh, from the beginning of the day, that day until uh, all the excitement happened, uh, he was hanging out with his bunch of militarized buddies, um, supposedly protecting private property, uh, car lots and so forth, that had already been uh, rioted and looted and destroyed the night before. So there were, there were very little, there was very little for them to do that night, um, they were basically there, and I will agree on the left in that, they were basically there as a uh, line in the sand, as a, as a, um, as a stake in the ground, uh, to say, uh, no more. And that is, that is a, that is easily, uh, that can be perceived as being, uh, being, I guess, aggressive. That is an aggressive act to stand around with shotguns, with pump shotguns and rifles and bolt action rifles and AR-15s and, and even AR-15 pistols um, and body armor. Uh, nothing happened during the protests. I assume that they were there all day. Uh, the official story, not the lie story that's on the media, but the true story is that uh, his buddy, who's 18, bought him with his money, uh, with Kyle's money, bought him uh, an AR-15, a full-length non-SBR, non-AOW, non-pistol AR-15, semi-automatic sporting rifle, and then kept it in that 18-year-old purchaser's uh gun safe that was owned by his dad in Kenosha, Wisconsin. So at no time did anybody cross state lines with, uh, with firearms and no times did, uh, the Kenosha kid, uh, possess that firearm unlawfully in Illinois. 
Um, everybody's talking about crossing borders, border crossing, crossing with guns. Strangely enough, Wisconsin is a lot freer of a gun rights state than Illinois is. Uh, rural Illinois may be less so than Chicago, but everybody knows that Wisconsin is a, quote, freer state than Illinois is. So by crossing borders from Illinois into Wisconsin, he was actually crossing into much more gun-friendly uh, land than, um, than, uh, than he would be in Illinois. Now, gun ownership is not residency-based. It, it is, it is location-based. Uh, while you cannot purchase a uh, a firearm, well, no, you you. And here's the thing: you cannot. I don't think you can buy pistols in a neighboring state, but I believe that you can buy rifles in a neighboring state. In Virginia, when I was buying pistols, I couldn't go to West Virginia or Maryland or D.C. or wherever, um, Tennessee. Kentucky to buy a pistol. I had to either buy it here at a local gun store, or I had to buy it, let's say, in Maryland at a, a Dick's or at a um, 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 uh, another sporting goods store. I would have to um, buy it there, but then have it transferred from the store to a gun broker. Uh, a gun reseller, a licensed uh, gun reseller. Um, it's called a FFL license, Federal Firearms License. Uh, so people in Virginia who have an FFL can buy and sell firearms. They can also broker deals across um, the postal system and between states. So if I buy one in Maryland... I will have it transferred via UPS or FedEx to someone in Virginia, such as another Dick Sporting Good, or to a an FFL uh, who could be a, a a private citizen or someone who works in a gun store or whatever. So, um, the concept of crossing state lines with the firearm has a lot of importance in places like if I were to go from Virginia where I can have guns all over my car, um, actually only as a concealed carry owner, but let's say as a regular owner with a rifle, you know, they, I could have a rifle in a, in a, uh, gun rack in the back of my pickup. I can have it in my trunk or whatever, but if I go into Maryland or DC, I have to, um, I have to secure those firearms. I have to separate the the ammunition from the firearm. I have to put the firearm into a lock box. Uh, I don't know if this is true, but I might have to not have the magazine in the firearm. And I don't know if this is true, but there might be states where you actually have to disassemble the firearm into its component parts, then put it in a lock box and then make sure that the ammunition is separate. And in a state like New Jersey, you have to do all the above, but you also cannot possess jacketed hollow point uh, or hollow point um, type of defensive bullets in that state. So every state is different and all that other kind of fun stuff. So this is the preface. This is the... the um, Whores divorce. This is the hors d'oeuvre before the meal in the next segment. I just wanted to kind of share about gun ownership. I didn't know that um, I didn't know that open carry by a seventeen-year-old was legal. I did know that a an adult. And by the way, this might not make any sense to you, but in America, uh, post two thousand five or two thousand six. Uh, and outside of California and the other unlaw, um, unfree states, the states that have strong uh, gun control, in every other state, including Wisconsin, a uh, an AR-15 with a 30-round magazine, one in the chamber, 16-inch um, or greater barrel, uh, etc., is considered just a regular sporting rifle. It is not 
a weapon of war. It is not an AK-15. It is not an AK-47. It's not an M-16. It is a semi-automatic, high capacity, which is not a thing. It's not a big deal in most American states. You can have 100 rounds or 50 rounds or 30 or 10 or 5 or 0. And so a sporting rifle is just a regular rifle. A regular rifle can be bought by anybody with a, with a, with a clear uh, background check at the, at, on their 18th birthday. So that might seem young to you, but that same person needs to be 21 or over in order to buy a pistol. So there, uh, there are no special, you need to be over 25 to buy an AR-15. You have to be 18. You can, you, you and, and apparently in, in many states, because of hunting and so forth, you can carry, open carry, over your shoulder, you can be in possession of, um, of, a, of a rifle. And apparently there were enough adults. I, I don't think this, the law stipulates if you have to be with an adult, if you have to commit to hunting animals. Um, I know there has to be a certain uh, uh, firearm length and length of barrel. Uh, but that's for all the rest of us, too. I mean, I'm 51, and if I buy a, a rifle that has under a 16-inch barrel... I believe, um, or a certain length length of, of gun, it's considered a short barrel rifle, which is uh, an NFA. Uh, it, it's 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 licensed and tracked the way you would uh, any type of exceptional firearm, such as a full automatic M16 or a full automatic Uzi or a, uh, a full automatic or, or, or an NFA um, device is, um, is a suppressor. You need to have a tax stamp and be, uh, and, and get a, a permanent, a specific permanent license to own a suppressor, to own a short barreled rifle, to own an, any other weapon, uh, to own a short barreled shotgun, um, all these other things. I mean, there's a loophole now called the um, AR-15 pistol, the AR-15, uh, the AK-47 pistol, uh, and the, um, I guess there is a pistol version of the shotgun now, which looks basically like a sawed-off shotgun to me. Um, Anyway, those those things cannot have uh, butt stocks, um, but they can have a thing called a, a brace. Look it up. It's it's amazingly. I understand why the um, why the uh, uh, BATF, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, um, and explosive explosives. I I I know why it's such a political position because. Um, there are so many loopholes in the law now, uh, that it's all the laws against short barreled rifles and short barreled shotguns have now become laughing stock because you can find ways around that to make them perfectly legal and perceived as a pistol. I get it. It's weird. I think it's cool because I like short barrel rifles, but it's weird. Um, all right, so let's get back to vigilantism. I know this has been a bit of a rant. I do not use notes. That might be amusing to you. That might be frustrating. Be right back. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. This is Chris Cast. My name's Chris Abraham. This is Season 3, Episode 4. Uh, I'm going to talk about vigi- vigilantism now. Um, someone just gave me the definition of vigilantism, and I hate, I hate quoting um, 
I really hate quoting those sorts of things. Let's see. A member of a volunteer committee organized to suppress and punish crimes summarily, as when the process of law are viewed as inadequate. Uh, the processes of law are view, viewed as inadequate. Broadly, a self-appointed doer of justice. Um, so, that is supposedly illegal. However, every single hero um, of... Every single hero uh, in all of storydom... Uh, including police and so forth, who pursue justice at the at the tip of a spear, at the at the at the muzzle of a gun, and pursue someone down, hunt them down, and and bring them to justice uh, with severe with with extreme prejudice. I'm not talking about um, necessarily uh, people who end up. In the uh, who end up in a lasso of truth and end up being left uh, dazed and confused for the police, but even them, even those people who are not um, who are left uh, for the police to bring them to jail with a note saying from your friendly neighborhood Spider Man, these are still vigilantes. I mean, this perception that vi vigilantes are only killers is not necessarily the full ramifications of uh, vigilantism. Vigilantism is taking the law into your own hands. Um, one might say that, that um, Batman is not a vigilante because Commissioner Gordon, or whoever it is, um, enables him or has deputized him to do these things. But even so... Um, <coughs> Even so, uh, the reason why Commissioner Gordon uses Batman is as a loophole and as a way of, if you will, uh, cleaning up the city uh, around the law. It is a uh, it is a loophole, and it just in the same way that that Kyle Rittenhouse's defense of uh, d defense of, of personal defense against attackers is a an, uh, as a reason to uh, kill his attackers are, are you know, legal uh, gray areas. I mean, personally, I believe that the, uh, I believe that the verdict on Kyle Rittenhouse is completely just. I believe my only caveat and my argument with people who say that if uh, Kyle Rittenhouse were black, it would be different is to say that then the law is right. You're saying the law is right. You're just saying the law is not uh, applied uh, righteously to all peoples. So Kyle Rittenhouse should have been um, released without any charges, all charges dropped. And what you're saying is that the law is not equally applied to people of color. I agree. I agree that... Uh, that the law applied to Kyle Rittenhouse is arguably not also uh, fairly shared with uh, poor people, uh, with, uh, with the mentally ill, and with, of course, minority peoples and peoples of color, especially black Americans. So that basically is saying that Kyle Rittenhouse's defense is, is a gold standard upon which all other people should be held. Not Kyle Rittenhouse should be thrown to the lions uh, just like all other people who do not have uh, the money, the profile, the support, etc. Um, those people who fall through the cracks. So I don't understand. I don't understand. Um... It's basically saying uh, my parents uh, were alcoholics and abusers, so you should 
not have a healthy, happy family uh, because I didn't have a healthy, happy family and we should all live in unhappy, unhealthy families. Like that doesn't make sense. Um, Or it could mean that, um, and this is what I think might be truer, is that um, the rule of law as it stands in America is white supremacist and ergo racist. And ergo, um, clearly defined as a way to keep people of color down and poor people down. It is a, uh, uh, and you know, that, that is arguably possibly true. That is arguably possibly true. But I think that everybody needs to be protected. Everybody needs to have their day in court and everybody needs to be uh, innocent until proven guilty. And I believe that what this is saying, and I'm using judo against the people who believe that uh, Kyle Rittenhouse was led, uh, was, was, had a verdict in his favor not because of the law, but because of his color. I would say that the law is completely clear and the just justice, the, the judge was just and the, and the jur, jurors were just. And I believe that um, uh, in many cases that this was the perfect example, the perfect precedent that needs to be shared around to uh, poor people, immigrants, people of color, and especially Eidos, Black Americans, African Americans. So, so back to vigil- vigilantism. I mean, every movie I see is about revenge. It's about ven- vengeance. It's about uh, going out and hunting down someone when the law um, betrays you. It is. They're all about, um, uh, you know, from the Punisher who is out there to go ahead and get vengeance against the people that killed his family to my favorite Pulp Fiction novel character, um, Mac Bolan, who had a war against the mafia and exacted um, uh, vengeance, uh, vigilante justice against uh, the mafia of the Northeast and in California, and eventually got the begrudging respect of the of the police and the people all these stories end up with um a man of the people the vigilante becomes a man of the people the vigilante becomes a populist prophet the vigilante becomes a hero the vigilante becomes a superhero i mean you know deadpool fires guns um it used to be uh killing um blatantly killing people on um, John Wick is a veg- vigilante hero. John Wick might have a code. Most vigilante heroes have a co- code. Uh, do not kill women or children. Do not kill uh, civilians. Do not. But ergo, um, all vigilante heroes, all vigilantes, aspire to, in their perception, only exact vengeance and vigilante justice on people that they perceive as criminals. Now, who is a criminal? A criminal is only the person who is considered a criminal uh, after the, uh, the justice system gets through with him. Right, and then even then, theoretically, after they serve their uh, their time in prison, that person is no longer a criminal. They might have a rap rap sheet, but they are not a criminal anymore. They've served their time. Now, it seems like the American public. I mean, you see this in in video games, in television shows. I mean, you know, one of my every single one of my favorite shows. And in fact, um, you know, uh, in many cases, uh, just so many of them have that uh, deep down uh, crime series. They're always fighting with their desire to go ahead. Like there's always a dirty cop who exacts revenge. There's always, uh, but that kind of person, people turn the other cheek. I mean, if, if programming is what it says it is, which is programming, 
you know, television, movie, everything programming, if these are programs and they run inside your head, then for the last, you know, since at least the 20s or 30s, since I listened to uh, serial radio shows from the 20s and 30s, I know that a big part of, of, um, of gumshoe uh, serial radio shows and other types of shows and shows like The Green Lantern and um, uh, The Spirit and um, whatever, also um, a bunch of the other ones. It's always about uh, a the Green Hornet, is that right? The Green Hornet and the Spirit and uh, all these other guys that who aren't lawyers, who are out there gunning for people, um, who go above and below the justice system are all considered vigilantes and they're, and they're American heroes from the Marvel universe to, uh, to the DC universe to, um, uh, Kung, uh, Gun Fu, uh, to John Wick, to the movie, the Joker, uh, to, I don't know how many television shows I can just think of blacklist right now. It's all about vengeance and revenge. Um, you know, the FBI is just being a fool or maybe being complicit. There's a lot of programming where, where the cops, uh, know that their hands are tied and tap a vigilante. Whether that's a former Navy SEAL, former Spetsnaz, former um, uh, asset, you know, even even that series that I enjoyed a little bit, uh, the 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 three days of the Condor, whatever, ended up being, in many cases, a vengeance plot. So, um, I guess what I never said, and I'll say the premise at the beginning before the TLDR. My premise has always been that when I watch. MSNBC, CNN, etc., um, fret, fret, fret publicly and in tears that the precedent that um, the Kyle Rittenhouse trial resulted in, which is you can go into a public area in a city, in a city, you know, you can go with a firearm into a into a riot, and you can stand around implicitly saying, I dare ya. Do you feel lucky? I dare ya. Do you feel lucky? And if the first person feels, for whatever reason, provoked enough, you know, that's the thing about provocation. If you, like, I'm a six foot three, relatively good looking, white, uh, 300 pound guy. And when I was a young man, I would by virtue of going to a bar or whatever, or out to a nightlife, I could end up being picked on by a shrimp, or by a little man, or by something, by uh, by a, a person who just wants to uh, prove something against me for just being there. I was never armed. I was never um, I was never jacked, but I was tall, and I was you know. Um, good looking enough, like I was, uh, I could be the target of, of that kind of, uh, targeting, especially if I was talking to pretty girls or whatever, that kind of deal, or if I was having fun or people were laughing around me or whatever, like there was always some jerk who wanted to come in and, you know, dominate me, um, or, you know, and sometimes I fought and I fought, I fought, when I fight, I fight uh, to end the confrontation. I'm not a, a, I'm not pugnacious. I'm, I'm going to stop this at all costs. And that was always that was never with any firearms or anything, no weapons at all. Um, you know, but if it came to it, I would you know pick up a table and and throw it and, and like knock them over the head with it, which is in fact um, illegal, right? Any type of assault is illegal. So none of those things are good, especially if you're carrying a weapon. But if you're going to define, defined, there, there, 
I want to know how it can be legal and acceptable and so forth. Like, it's not like, um, it's not like the places that these riots are happening are hallowed land, right? Um, if nobody has a right to riot, and also, maybe nobody has a right to stand around with an AR-15. Uh, um, but I would say that rioting and destroying a city is as much provocation to response as is standing around with body armor and AR-15 while being white. They're all provocative acts. Staying at home and not attending a riot, or when the peaceful process, when the peaceful protest turns dark, uh, dark is in uh, dangerous and rife with danger, then leaving and dispersing is always a smart idea. Um, now that everybody's a journalist, I guess only the, the only good stuff starts happening uh, when the violence starts. All the, the, and, and honestly, the, the panopticon and the, and the ubiquitous cameras including drones who knew and um and local uh doorbell cams and people's dash cams and their phones and their uh gopros and etc 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 means that in the future um more and more crimes will be based on uh on visual evidence rather than uh hearsay or, um, you know, um, oath taking and then, and then, you know, giving your truth and so forth. He said, she said, so it will be interesting. I believe that, um, vigilant, vigilantism is, is, I would say that the riots in the street are vigilantism, right? They're, they're, um, their ang the anger at the police, that's vigilante justice. Anger at the federal buildings, that's vigilante justice. Anger, I mean, it's all not allowing the system because it, it's a belief that the system doesn't work anymore. All riots are vigilante justice um, and opportunism and looting, right? There's a lot of people uh, when a fight breaks out there are a lot of sociopaths and psych psychopaths who are like i'm gonna have an opportunity to beat the shit out of someone without being held accountable for it um you know the fog of war uh all the sociopaths psychopaths and secret murderers come out in the fog of war and so there's always going to be those people which is why none of the victims of uh, kyle rittenhouse's um uh, defense, none of them had a clean record. All of them had really long, really terrible criminal histories. Even the boyfriend of the green-haired girl, even the boyfriend of the green-haired green girl, I would guess his name was B. Uh, Grosskreutz. Grosskreutz, and we all know that uh, Rosenbaum was a child sex offender, and Rosenkreutz, and, and no, 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 the guy with the the uh, skateboard uh, was the green-haired girl's boyfriend. Uh, I forget his name because I won't say his name. I don't. I don't believe that there are any heroes there. I don't believe. I believe that Kyle Rittenhouse is not a is not a saint, is not a hero. But to the right, he is a saint and a hero. And you know, against my better judgment, the left always. Uh, their entire suite of saints over the last five years have all had incredible rap, seat, rap sheets. So I don't know. They're not used to be that the left would always choose um, people with hopeful futures who were, you know, national merit scholars and who had 4.0s and who were captain of the basketball and, and uh, track team. But now everybody who is uh, officially on the wall of saints are all uh, convicted criminals. They might be, be they're all, every human being is a beautiful child of God. I, I dare say everybody, uh, there are beautiful children of God 
who have criminal histories all the time. I mean, I, I volunteered at Miriam's Kitchen, and um, I didn't only serve uh, the needs of, uh, of uh, people without criminal histories. Um, and I personally believe that people who come out of jail need a place to live, and they need a place to work, and they need an honorable life. I believe that that do your time, uh, do your crime, do your time, but afterwards you need to land somewhere. You need to be loved and supported. You, 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 you can't be ground into the soil. I also believe that this happens to veterans as well. You know, spend them, uh, you know, use them up in the field during their uh, teens, 20s, and 30s, and then screw them. Man, they're ruined when they get back. I don't believe that. Uh, I believe that um, you don't have to put a tiger down just because that tiger's uh, tasted human flesh. I believe that all uh, people and all animals can be... uh, can be rewired. That's why I'm a big proponent of pit bulls. I love pit bulls. Um, Anyway, I'm going off the rails. Uh, I just want to say that I believe that we are imbued in a culture of violence. We are uh, imbued. Hey, Google, what does imbued mean? Hey, Google. Here's the death. What does imbued mean? Here's the definition of imbue. Inspire or permeate with a feeling or quality. That's good. I was going to say infused, imbued, imbibed. Hey, Google, what does the word imbibe mean? Here's the definition of imbibe. Formal, often humorous. Drink, alcohol. So we're all drunk on violence. We're drunk on guns. We're also drunk on, on, uh, on taking the law into your own hands if uh, the law doesn't seem up for the job. Uh, It is in our DNA. It is, um, no, you know what? Vigilante justice goes all the way back uh, to, in terms of the worship, worshiping it, all the way back to the wild, wild west. I mean, where uh, it was perfectly okay for everybody to walk around with with open carry uh, uh, rifles, uh, shotguns, and revolvers, and where people would challenge other people for high noon uh, at OK Corral, middle of the street, uh, drawing and shooting at each other. I think that uh, in many ways, uh, the, uh, the whole experience during uh, the Kenosha events that resulted in uh, Kyle Rittenhouse being taken up on charges, the entire event was very similar to the Wild West, right? Kyle went out armed. Um, people decided they didn't like him. They didn't appreciate his be- him being there. They didn't like the fact that he was armed, and he was not where he should have been. So each person person decided to take a pop at him and that's why they call him the Kenosha kid this is really uh an ana- and, and America loves wild west analogies they're calling him the Kenosha kid because he was able to outdraw and outshoot all of his attackers and in a world of uh that that um that has multiple uh federal holidays based on uh, winning wars and also unofficial holidays based on the anniversaries of Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines. Uh, we live in a world that, consi- that, that lionizes and, and, and worships uh, um, armed violence. And as a result, I do agree with all y'all that this verdict coming out completely not guilty on all counts is going to embolden everyone involved. Everyone involved is going to be emboldened and uh, the um, 2022 word of the year will be vigilantism. So that's it. That's all I got. Talk to you guys soon. Aloha, mahalo, love you.
Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. This is Chris Cast, Season 3, Episode 4 on Vigilantism. Um, my name's Chris Abraham. I'm at chrisabraham.com. On Twitter, I'm at chrisabraham. Uh, on Instagram, I'm at chrisabraham. On YouTube, I'm at chrisabraham. On Reddit, I'm at chrisabraham. Um, slash you slash Chris Abraham, you know what I mean. On Facebook, I'm Chris Abraham. On uh, I believe on TikTok, I'm Christopher Abraham. On I don't know. On uh, my phone number is plus one two zero two three five two five zero five one, and that connects you to my text to my uh, to my signal. It connects you to. Uh, my telegram to my messenger and all of that. You can email me at chris at abraham.su and um, also you please, please, please uh, give me five stars on your uh, podcasting app. Please give me five stars or thumbs up, subscribe and like and click the notification bell if you're listening to this on YouTube, and if you are on any platform, please review on your app or platform and give me stars, or go out of your way to um, go out of your way to uh, Apple Podcasts and give me a review and some stars. Uh, my home site is anchor.fm slash Chris Abraham, but you can find me on Spotify, Amazon, you can find me everywhere, including YouTube. So I hope you're well and talk to you soon. Uh, I'll get another episode in when I get another episode in. Mahalo. <laughs>